This is Elena Larson, special reporter. Today I'm going to ask Dr. Ken Larson to take a walk through the chart that Dr. William Glasser has put together to try to explain a little bit about how the brain works to direct and control our behavior. When I first saw this chart, it seemed very busy to me. It probably does to you too. Let's see if Dr. Larson can help give us some insight into what the chart represents. Dr. Larson, thanks again for being with us. Thank you, Elena. I enjoy working with you. What's your first question? How would you describe what we are seeing in this chart? Let me first acknowledge the reference I'm using for this discussion. It's called Chart Talk by Carlene Glasser, and uh, it's available from the Glasser Institute. The chart itself can be called a graphical metaphor. Dr. Glasser's chart is a symbolic representation of the function and processes of our brain that takes place as we interface with the world around us. It's a way for us to picture and understand how our brain acts as a control system to help us get our needs met. So what we are seeing are representations of different processes that our brain uses to direct our behavior? Yes. Let me, let me just sort of flip through the chart like you would a magazine to give you a very general and sketchy overview. We'll start with the reality that there are two worlds we live in. There's the outside world that we'll call the real world, and then there is the inner world where we take our experiences of the real world and bring them into our mind. This is like the way a camera takes an image from outside, captures it, and stores it inside in some medium. So our sensory system works in a similar fashion to capture sensations from our world and store them in our brain. We can call this memory storehouse of experience our perceived world. That is an interesting overview. Will you walk us through the chart so that we can get a better idea of how this internal control system works? Choice theory states that all living organisms have a purpose to their behavior and are internally driven by basic needs or genetic instructions that arise in the brain. We recognize four human physiological needs, love and belonging, power, freedom, and fun, which originate in the new brain and there's the most basic need that Dr. Glasser calls survival, which arises from the brain stem, or the so-called old brain. So from birth, we are constantly driven by these basic needs, and all of our behavior is our best attempt at the time to fulfill them. So it is these basic needs that seem to drive the behaviors we choose. Yes, we work to meet these needs by following what Dr. Glasser calls our quality world pictures, which are mental models which represent the actual people, things, and beliefs that we've learned will fulfill these needs. These pictures are not abstractions, but images of what exists in the real world. For example, we do not search for love, we search for a specific person to love, who loves us. These pictures are stored in what is called the quality world because in it are all the people, things, ideas, and ideals that we have discovered will increase the quality of our lives quality world pictures. That is an interesting phrase. What does it mean? As I mentioned, our lives are driven by the pictures in our quality world because they represent the fulfillment of our needs. These quality world pictures are simply the way we think about the people, things, and beliefs that help us meet our needs. When we think about a person that helps us meet our needs, there's a face in our mind that represents that person. When we think about the material things that meet our needs, there is an image and not just an abstraction. Advertising people know how to plant attractive pictures in our minds so we'll buy their product. As an example, let's think of two people. One is a guy who enjoys hunting. The other is a grandmother with a large family. Now as the calendar turns to November, what images do you think would form quality world pictures in their minds? The guy could be thinking of his favorite hunting spot with his hunting buddies and Grandma is probably making plans for gathering with her family for Thanksgiving. Those thoughts of anticipation of hunting and of Thanksgiving dinners, th those are quality world pictures. I'm interested in why the perceived world of each of us is unique and different from the perceived world of others. Don't we experience the same real world? So why aren't our perceptions the same? 
because each of us have different experiences, values, and beliefs that influence the interpretations we put on our sensations as they become our perceptions. We each have a unique filter system based on what we have learned, what we have experienced, and what we believe. These filters shape our perceptions. Back to your comment that our perceived world is more real than the real world. Is that because the information we have in our perceived world represents the real world to us? The only way we have of experiencing the real world is through the representations we have in our perceived world that we get through our senses. Think of a tree. It's clear that we do not hold an actual tree in our brain, but only a symbolic representation of the tree, usually a word, and that word usually has some sort of picture or image attached to it. Some may see a birch tree, some may see a Christmas tree, etc. So our reality of the tree exists in our perception only. Helping people learn that other people do not perceive the world the same way they do is almost always a vital part of teaching, counseling, and ministry. I'm looking at the chart and how there are those arrows going from the perceived world to the scales. Tell us what that means. Our behavior is always our best attempt at the time to satisfy a picture from our quality world. We become aware that the picture is unsatisfied by the tipping of the scale in the comparing place. The tip scales produce an urge or signal to do something. I can then choose a behavior that I've learned or create a new one that will increase my sense of effective control over my life. The more the scale is tipped, the stronger the signal, the stronger my urge to behave. In my experience, we tend to think of our actions as behavior and what we think and feel are separate. This idea of total behavior, linking these separate experiences into what is called total behavior is new to me. It really is intriguing when I see that this total behavior even includes our physiology. I understand. Let me try to explain the concept of total behavior. All behaviors are total because they are always made up of four individual components, acting, thinking, feeling, and physiology. Each of those is always present. Now, keep in mind, every total behavior is labeled by its most recognizable component. For example, depressing is a total behavior in which feeling is the most recognizable component. Running would be acting, studying would be thinking, and hunger would have physiology as its most, most recognizable component. So the best way to understand the important concept of total behavior is to use the car analogy shown on the chart. The car is directed to satisfy what we want to meet our needs. We can steer the car with the front wheels, which are our actions and our thoughts. The rear wheels are the feeling and the physiology components, and as in a real car, these fixed wheels must go where the front wheels go. The analogy is highly accurate in the sense that we have much more control over the front wheels, acting and thinking, than we do over the rear wheels, feeling and physiology. By directing our front wheels, the actions we choose and the thoughts we hold we can have an impact on our emotions and our physiology, our back wheels. If possible, we'd not like our back wheels to be steering our behavioral car. Mm, but that's a whole subject in itself. Phew, <laughs> that is a lot to think about. I can understand why you warned us that this is just a very thin air overview. Is there anything you want to add before we say goodbye? Just a summary statement to a question I imagine some of our viewers may be asking. So what? How does this relate to real life? The main purpose of reality therapy is to help people learn they can choose more effective behaviors. What we can do that will directly lead a client or a person to feel better is to help him concentrate on the front wheels, which means to steer his behavioral car in a better direction. In practice, this means to choose a more effective way to act and to think. How can people get more information on the chart and what Dr. Glasser teaches? You can Google the Glasser Institute for more information. You can get a copy of Choice Theory and read it, or you can always send me an email and I'll help if I can. That's Dr. Ken Larson, one word, at gmail.com. Thank you, Dr. Larson, for being with us. I look forward to more of what you can share with us at some future time. This is Elena Larson, signing off.